In this video, we're going to look at what the Torah actually states about life after death. <laughs> last video, the Torah doesn't actually go into great depth with regard to the afterlife, but we concluded that the Torah does create an atmosphere which sort of assumes the afterlife. In other words, it's a scriptural given. From the very beginning, the Torah acknowledges that man's creation and something intrinsic about man himself is distinct from that of other creatures on earth. Then, Adonai Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.7 Now, if we continue to the next chapters, we will see with regard to eating the forbidden fruit, a similar distinction, as well as an explicit reference to everlasting life. And Adonai Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore Adonai Elohim sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. And so he drove out the man, and placed at the east of the garden of Eden the Keruvim, and the flaming sword which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. Although these verses do not teach that man is promised everlasting life. These verses do clearly inform us that according to the Torah, according to the Jewish faith, everlasting life is a potential. Not only is it a potential, but the verses do not say that God removed that potential with the violation of eating the forbidden fruit, but rather that this potential for everlasting life was guarded by the Kruvim, by the cherubs, whatever the cherubs are. In other words, everlasting life is still within man's reach, theoretically, as it is dependent upon reaching the tree of life and of eating of the tree of life. Of course, we know that later on in Jewish literature, the Torah itself is equated with the tree of life, though it's a side issue with regard to God referring to he has become like one of us. Um, suffice it to say that uh, among other alternatives to the traditional Christian Trinitarian explanation of that verse, we have the very obvious fact that um, already in these chapters we see a being, the serpent, who itself knows the difference between good and evil, as well as the angelic type beings, the cherubs, that are mentioned in the very same context. And this is among the reasons that uh, Jewish tradition views angels being included in the us, uh, among some other explanations as well. It's in the very context of the passage. Now, as we continue reading in the Torah, we will come across other concepts with regard to the afterlife. We have the idea of the righteous being gathered unto their people. And Abraham expired and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered unto his people. Genesis 25, verse 8. And in contrast to that, we have those who high-handedly violate God's law, certain aspects of God's law, um, being cut off from their people. And the uncircumcised male, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Genesis 17, verse 14. In the case of circumcision, as also with some other cases in the Torah, the fact that no specific point in time of the human's life that he abstains from circumcision, uh, no particular point in his life is given for when violation of this commandment will incur a human penalty. Uh, therefore, it is understood that this penalty is a cutting off which occurs after his death. In other words, it is some sort of a spiritual excision. In Hebrew, it's called kadet. In the next video, we will continue looking at what the Hebrew scriptures have to say about life after death. But for the remainder of this video, I'd like to quote an excerpt from Joseph Telushkin's book, Jewish Literacy.
Since Judaism does believe in the next world, Olam Haba, how does one account for the Torah's silence? I suspect that there is a correlation between its non-discussion of afterlife and the fact that the Torah was revealed just after the long sojourn of the Jewish people in Egypt. The Egyptian society from which the Hebrew slaves emerged was obsessed with death and afterlife. The holiest Egyptian literary work was called the Book of the Dead, while the major achievements of the pharaohs was the erection of the giant tombs called pyramids. In contrast, the Torah was obsessed with this world, so much so that it even forbids its priests from coming into contact with dead bodies. The Torah, therefore, might have been silent about afterlife, out of a desire to ensure that Judaism not evolve in the direction of the death-obsessed Egyptian religion. Throughout history, those religions that have assigned a significant role to afterlife have often permitted other religious values to become distorted. For example, belief in the afterlife motivated the men of the Spanish Inquisition to torture innocent human beings. They believed it was morally desirable to torture people for a few days in this world until they accepted Christ and thereby save them from the eternal torments of hell. And of course, the same can be said about suicidal terrorist attacks in our modern times. In Judaism, the belief in the afterlife is less a leap of faith than a logical outgrowth of other Jewish beliefs. If one believes in a God who is all-powerful and all-just, one cannot believe that this world, in which evil is far too often triumphing, that this is the only arena in which human life exists. For if this existence is the final word and God permits evil to win, then it cannot be that God is good. Thus, when someone says he believes in God, but not in the afterlife, it would seem that either they have not thought the issue through, or they don't believe in God, or the divine being in whom they believe is amoral or immoral. All attempts to describe heaven and hell are, of course, speculative. Because Judaism believes that God is good, it believes that God rewards good people. It does not believe that Adolf Hitler and his victims share the same fate. Beyond that, it is hard to assume much more. We are asked to leave the afterlife in God's hands. Please share your thoughts and comments below. And if you liked this video, please click the like button, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by clicking the PayPal link below. And remember, there's no wisdom, nor insight, nor reasonable advice against the Lord.